مباشرة على حل قريب للأزمة الخليجية ومصر التحريض على السعودية والإمارات Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're looking at this week. There's news of a possible reconciliation in the Arabian Gulf, the end of the blockade of Qatar. The French president bestows President Sisi of Egypt with the Legion of Honor, but makes sure there are no French journalists there to cover it. Science reporters have proven their value in covering the pandemic. They've also taken some heat. And finally, what are the chances that the planet Earth would be accepted for membership in a galactic federation? Is there enough food to go around? It looks like some people are starving. Based on our track record, not great. It's been three and a half years now since four Arab governments, led by Saudi Arabia, cut off relations with Qatar and imposed a blockade on the country. Now there are headlines suggesting that a rapprochement is at hand. When this rift opened up back in 2017, Qatar's critics, which included the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt, all demanded that this network, Al Jazeera, be shut down, while accusing Qatar of backing political movements that trade in terror. In the years since, the information sphere has proven to be a crucial battleground, from the competing television channels owned and influenced by the governments involved to the armies of trolls and influencers on Twitter and Facebook, to the millions of dollars spent on lobbyists trying to get Washington on side. Now, with Riyadh showing signs of making peace with Doha, there's some careful message management underway, and everyone covering the story has to read between the lines. Our starting point this week, the Arab Airwaves. For almost four years now, a Saudi-led coalition of Arab countries has tried to isolate Qatar, politically and economically. Blocking trade with Qatar, forcing it to import food from Iran and Turkey, turning the airspace over their countries into no-fly zones for Qatari passenger planes, and turning their airwaves into delivery platforms for anti-Qatar rhetoric. Al Arabiya is just one example. The channel is Saudi controlled, based in Dubai. Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, has a majority stake in Sky News Arabia. The channel is a central protagonist in what has turned into an anti Qatar media coalition. Qatar, after more than three years of that kind of talk, there is change on the air, certainly in Saudi-controlled media, although you still have to read between the sound bites. The tone also appears more conciliatory on Al Jazeera's Arabic language news channel, which, like this channel, is funded by the government of Qatar. He's a very, very a serious situation with a very serious crisis and on multiple levels. Um, and also, um, we, so we, we saw different blocks emerged within the Gulf, showing us that the Gulf countries are actually divided and that they don't all have one policy outlook. That while culturally, uh, Gulf might be united politically, economically, strategically, it's definitely not. It's uh, information war. Uh, all countries in 2017 were ready for such war. They have experience on how to control the social media sphere, the media sphere, to use their trolls, to use their armies. So these governments, they were all ready for the fight. Saudi Arabia and Qatar have not been on the same political page for decades. Qatar's independent brand of foreign policy took form in the early 90s and its launch of Al Jazeera Arabic in 1996 changed the relationship Qatar had with its neighbors in the Gulf. Al Jazeera journalists offered the kind of reporting critical of authority 
that the Saudis and other Arab governments did not tolerate on their own state-funded channels. They still don't. In 2017, when Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, was made Saudi crown prince, the gloves came off. The blockade was in place. As the Saudis, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt issued a list of 13 demands the Qataris had to meet if relations were to be normalized. Qatar has not budged. It turned to Turkey and Iran for trade help and has drawn closer to the Islamic Republic, redirecting its planes through Iranian airspace. Not the outcome the Saudis were looking for. The political transition now unfolding in Washington and the management of MBS's reputation also appear to have factored into this current shift in Riyadh's tactics. Mohammed bin Salman's name uh, was uh, synonymous to so many negatives in the region. Uh, he was there when several Saudi businessmen were uh, locked in a hotel in, in Riyadh. His name is there in Yemen. We saw his name involved with Jamal Khashoggi. So he has so many negative things associated with his name. So I think most of the people who followed his policies thought that there is a time when Mohammed bin Salman will start a new strategy. And uh, I think uh, Qatar is the easiest issue he can solve. With the ending uh, term of uh, Donald Trump and a new administration that would uh, likely be harsher on Saudi Arabia and on Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the Saudi current prince desires to find solutions to some of the foreign policy issues to make his image better on the international front. So this will also uh, help in his ambitions to become uh, the next king of Saudi Arabia. The list of the 13 demands the coalition made, conditions to end the blockade, started with Qatar curbing its diplomatic ties with Iran and bringing an end to military cooperation with both Iran and Turkey, countries the Saudis and Emiratis consider their adversaries. In addition, the coalition demanded Qatar sever all ties with what the quartet calls terrorist organizations, including the Muslim Brotherhood, ties Qatar has denied. Also on the list was Al Jazeera and the requirement that Qatar shut the network and its journalism down. Those who follow uh, Gulf politics know that Al Jazeera uh, was the main focus of all these countries. They moved from targeting Al Jazeera directly to targeting Al Jazeera in Washington, D.C., trying to convince Congress to shut down Al Jazeera, to constrain their movement in Washington and, and, and in the U.S. Al Jazeera survived, and it will survive for a very simple reason. There is no foreign official who respects freedom of speech will go to Qatar or Doha and tell them, please close Al Jazeera to end this rift. They're Al Arabiya on the Saudi side uh, and Sky Arabia on the UAE side. And then there's a whole bunch of different um, smaller networks. But the flagships are Al Arabiya and Sky Arabia. And neither has had the experience, the quality, the money, the resources, the staffing that Al Jazeera has had. On the other hand, as I say, its reputation as being above the fray has changed. So now I think what a lot of people do is they watch some Al Jazeera and they watch some Al Arabiya and they assume the truth is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> I cannot predict what will be, uh, what the future threats to Al Jazeera will be. And I think uh, time has shown us and that Al Jazeera is uh, resilient. And because one of the demands was to shut down Al Jazeera. It was also, I think, kind of seen as a responsibility to now heighten this investigative journalism. Al Jazeera was kind of reflecting the uh, Qatar's policy outlook. But on the other hand, I think they were also trying to really also defend themselves as an institution that was directly under attack. And, you know, attack on Jazeera was an attack on, on the freedom of media and journalism. The rift has also transformed the online space in the Gulf. Just prior to the blockade, a new network of Twitter accounts was born in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Troll armies tweeting and retweeting hashtags like Qatar funds terror or we demand the closing of the channel of pigs. There was evidence of some pro-Qatar material driven by bots too, but not to the same extent. 
It's been three years plus of toxicity online between collegians, Gulf Arabs, that will not be easy to just turn off. Mainly on Twitter, uh, also on other social media outlets, which uh, actually uh, increased the antagonism between not only these governments, but also between the peoples of these uh, GCC states, which actually have common cultures uh, uh, among themselves. There, a new law was uh, passed, which basically criminalized showing any sympathy towards Qatar. Really famous Khaliji singers uh, that wrote a song against Qatar. <laughs> A third thing that I think was also very interesting and also very shocking was using tribalism as a tool to mobilize people against their government or against their leadership. So I think the blockade has definitely changed the whole concept of Khaliji identity, of cultural identity and national identity. And this is the thing that is difficult to repair. Now the door is open for the peoples to um, to criticize, but uh, if the media and the main uh, media stream tone down their criticism of the other, um, I, th I think uh, life will uh, maybe go back to normal. Qatar has always wanted to get out of this situation without capitulating, and uh, the UAE, I think, is unpersuaded. I mean, this isn't like an unbridgeable divide. Nobody invaded and occupied somebody else. This isn't, you know, Kuwait is remembering Saddam's Iraq or something, but there's real bitterness and the bitterness is not going to go away that quickly. One of the countries in the anti-Qatar quartet that's been less visible in this potential rapprochement has been Egypt. President Sisi has been busy with a few other things, including a state visit to France. Minakshi Rabi has been keeping an eye on that. Mina, how did this visit turn into a media story? Well, one of the big reasons, Richard, was when the French government attempted to hide one of the main events in this visit, when President Sisi was presented with France's highest award, the Legion of Honor. It was a gala event held at the Elysee Palace, capping a three-day visit, and there were no French media present, which is absurd. The palace's website had no mention of it, and the French president's office, that is Macron's office, failed to provide any footage or images to French media. French outlets only found out about this event after an investigation by a TV show, which was tipped off by coverage in Egyptian media. Car dans l'agenda du président, officiellement, il termine sa journée hier soir à 18h. C'est marqué. Alors que non, on retourne sur le site du président égyptien. Et ils ont donc été les seuls à, à être autorisés à filmer hier soir. Aucune caméra française, aucune agence, rien. So what are we to make of the secretive approach that the French government took with this? There's been a lot of pushback against President Macron hosting, let alone celebrating President Sisi. Over the past couple of months, France has been grappling with debates about freedom of speech and religion. We've covered some of this on our show. And Macron has spoken about the fact that France upholds people's right to not just speak, but to offend. He's also talked about French secularist principles, saying that the country is in a battle against what he calls Islamic extremism, and that the religion is in some sort of crisis. So how would Macron square that against what's happening in Egypt under Sisi? Well, that's where the problems emerge. Egyptians can be arrested and tortured simply for participating in protests. They can be jailed for social media posts that supposedly offend people's religious sentiments. And if you're an activist or a journalist, there's a target on your back. Al Jazeera's own Mahmoud Hussein has been in jail for four years in Egypt, but the government has yet to charge him with any crime. So clearly the French government realized that lecturing people on secularism and free speech while pinning an award on an authoritarian leader of a deeply conservative religious country is not a good look. So they just pretended it didn't happen. Okay, thanks, Mina. Journalists around the world will remember 2020 as the year they took a crash course in reporting on medical science. They had no experience in covering a pandemic, and we've documented some of the shortcomings in their reporting. Now we're turning to journalists with some actual credentials in this field, science and health reporters. It's been a year to the month since they first recognized the potential dangers of the outbreak in Wuhan, leaving the rest of us to play catch up. Historically underappreciated and usually underrepresented in newsrooms, science and health reporters now find their expertise is in demand. Their rise to prominence has been accompanied by a new level of scrutiny in the kind of work that they do and the critics have come out of the woodwork. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on science journalism, the highs and lows in the age 
of COVID-19. 4.20 p.m., December 31st, 2019. Hopefully this is nothing out of the ordinary, but an at ProMed mail posting about unexplained pneumonias in China is giving me hashtag SARS flashbacks. Boston, USA. In the last few hours of 2019, Helen Branswell, senior infectious disease reporter for Stat News, started tweeting about the reports coming out of Wuhan. It was something I definitely thought we needed to be watching. This was something that was setting off alarm bells. 12.31 a.m., January 15th, 2020. Here's where we are on the SARS-like virus found in China. Still many, many questions. Two weeks later, in Berlin, Kai Kupferschmidt, a molecular biomedicine expert and correspondent for Science magazine, joined the discussion about the still undefined virus. It was really becoming clear that the pandemic was just not going to be stopped. It was clear to everyone what was about to happen. 11.35 a.m., January 29, 2020. Modi government's science denialism will get us all killed long before fascism gets a chance. Hashtag coronavirus pandemic. By the end of January, health and science journalist Vidya Krishnan was trying to get the word out in India despite facing significant political challenges. Because the entire political machinery was only focused on uh, the Hindu-Muslim riots in the country, no one paid attention to this pandemic, which was inching closer every day. Three science journalists from three different countries, all sounding the alarm on the virus that would come to be known as COVID-19, well before the rest of the world realized what was coming. Their readership and online followings have skyrocketed as they've taught you terms like flattening the curve. They've schooled you on the importance of lockdowns and mass testing. They've documented the failings of governments to act when the data was there for all to see. And they know how to deal with scientists. In early February, Helen Branswell challenged Dr. Anthony Fauci who many consider to be the voice of reason on the Trump administration's coronavirus task force. At present, given everything that's going on, the risk is really relatively low. Explain to me why the risk is low, somebody, because to me, when I look at this, this virus spreading, it's spreading very eff efficiently. And I can't see why, like, there's no force field around China. Right. It's not going right. to stop there. Uh, again, uh, Helen, you seem pretty frustrated in that forum. Why was that? You know, I had been hearing for several weeks authorities in the US and other countries outside of China saying that they thought that the risk outside of China was low. And it made zero sense to me because the virus was spreading really effectively from person to person in China. So when Dr. Fauci said that he thought the risk was quite low for the United States at that point, I pushed back because it made no sense. He did say, you know, could this become a pandemic? Absolutely. But it felt like they didn't want to alarm people. At that point, it wasn't coming. It was already, you know, spreading in the United States. It just hadn't been recognized. Kai, your work has also proven to be prescient. An article you wrote back in 2013 included a quote about a bat in China carrying a potential pandemic. This was Peter Daszak, a, a researcher that I had talked to. That quote comes from him. So I was just doing my job as a reporter, reporting his views. So, you know, if anything, he predicted it. Again and again in the, in the last 10 years or so, when I was doing my reporting, this, this sentence came up from scientists where they were telling me, you know, it's not a question of if there will be uh, a big pandemic, the question is when. Scientists like Peter Daszak are crucial for reporters like Kupferschmidt, because like most areas of reporting, science journalism starts with the sources. And there are two sources that many science journalists have in common. The first is called ProMed. It's the place where both Branswell and Kupferschmidt first heard about an outbreak in Wuhan. It's an online portal where infectious disease experts share and discuss information on unusual health events. It's not designed for journalists, but has become invaluable for many health reporters who have the background to understand the significance of what's on there. 
The second source these journalists have in common is what they call pre-print servers. They're a kind of testing ground for academics, a place where they share their research online before it gets peer-reviewed and published. In normal times, a lot of scientists hold that research back, play it safe until they're sure of their work. But COVID-19 has changed things. Scientists are flooding the servers with information they hope will help curb the virus, maybe even cure it. And some of that material is making it into the headlines. When that happens, and potentially invaluable but often unverified information reaches the public, it can easily end up being misconstrued by both the press and politicians. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. One of the things that I found tragic about uh, this pandemic and the coverage of the pandemic is how politicized the whole thing has become. Which side of the divide people fall on relates to which party they support. There's a deep misunderstanding of what's going on in certain parts of the country. We have a right-wing anti-science government which has been pushing out traditional remedies and it has been asking uh, our population to rely on Ayurveda or homeopathy or yoga or Greek medicine to boost your immunity. Apni immunity badhane ke liye Ayush Mantralay dwara jo nirdesh diye gaye hain उसका अगर हम पालन करें गर्म पानी है काढ़ा है इनका निरंतर सेवन करें दे वांट द रिपोर्टिंग टू बी इन लाइन विद द पॉलिटिक्स सो दैट इट डजंट मेक इंडिया लुक बैड द मिनट द स्टोरी गोस ऑनलाइन वी हैव गवर्नमेंट हैंडल्स एंड पॉलिटिशियंस अटैकिंग इंडिविजुअल रिपोर्टर्स एंड क्वेश्चनिंग आवर इंटीग्रिटी एंड डिसमिसिंग द स्टोरी without actually pointing out what's wrong factually that's been put out. One of the reasons the politics tends to trump the science is because that's the way the politicians want it, reflected in the officials they make available at their briefings, where scientific experts are usually outnumbered by politicos. Reflected also in the press corps covering them, a shortage of reporters trained in the science of the story. I'm not sure that science journalists need to take the lead, but I certainly think they should be, you know, at the table. And I think that is something that also bothers me when I see the press conferences. There are a lot of important questions that science journalists know to ask, that political journalists don't know to ask. Do you have a message for people in Georgia who are soon going to have a choice about going to the hair salon or the nail salon or getting that tattoo? Retail businesses need a bit of time, shops need a bit of time to prepare to open. Are they opening on June the 1st? Mich würde interessieren, für welchen Zeithorizont diese Planungen gelten. Hat das Auswirkungen auf politische Gipfel bei der EU-Ratspräsidentschaft oder aber uh, in Bayern auf die Wiesen? It just seems like these press conferences would really profit if there were also science journalists there. We are reporting with our hands tied behind our back. We don't have access to information. And our scientists do not, are not free to express their opinions. We have a daily media briefing, which uh, at this point does not have a single scientist briefing us and does not have a single science journalist in the audience. We have bureaucrats and uh, bureaucrats uh, don't know what they're talking about. And the political journalists don't know uh, they are asking the wrong questions. Another way to put it, rather than dispatching medical specialists to diagnose the biggest story of our time, to surgically dissect political narratives on COVID-19, most news organisations are sending in the equivalent of family doctors, the general practitioners of journalism. That's hardly the best use of available resources when the story you're covering is a pandemic. And finally, as this problematic year draws to a close with its biggest news stories still swirling around us, the pandemic, racial and social unrest, climate change, kind of makes you wish you could just leave it all behind. Maybe jump on one of Elon Musk's rocket ships and find another planet to live on. Except one of those rocket ships just crashed and burned this past week somewhere in Texas. 2020 wins again. Vinnie Thomas, a U.S.-based comedian, is thinking along similar lines. 
In this viral video, he imagines what it would be like if the planet Earth was to apply for membership in a Star Trek-like galactic federation, sort of like a European Union, except for outer space. And he concludes that Earthlings would be long shots unless we clean up our act. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. How fast are your teleporters? No teleporters. Uh, uh, flying cars. No. Uh, a high-speed train that goes around the planet? No, you don't have that either. Okay. <laughs> what about, does everyone have health care? Is there enough food to go around? It looks like some people are starving. You do have enough food. Then why isn't it logistics? You want me to write logistics? Okay. Starving because of logistics. <laughs> I mean, things could be worse, right? <laughs> Imagine if you were still fighting over resources. <laughs> oh, you do? You have big wars? Oh, and you have a pandemic. Right now, you have a pandemic. Oh, no, it's... Jason? Bring the san... Bring the sanitizer. Thank you. You need to use the bathroom? Uh-uh. We haven't done that in centuries. We don't do that here. Oh, you still have prisons. Oh, Jason, they still have prisons. Okay, well, I think that should be enough. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Jason burned their application. It's disgusting. The whole planet 